Hi guys, how are you doing today? I'm so excited to be back on our next live airing of Dr. Sumner's Summit to Wellness. I'm happy to have you guys here with me. Uh, definitely tag your friends, tag your loved ones. We've got a really excited, I think very helpful topic to be able to share with you today. For those of you who um, don't know me, I'm Dr. Sumner. Felicia Sumner. I am your board certified family medicine physician and wellness strategist. I am dedicated to helping you and your communities become well, that is whole, energized, and loving life. And I currently do this through speaking engagements, telemedicine services, online coaching services, and very soon through my direct primary care practice as well. Hi, Dr. Nicole. Thanks so much for joining us. I also need to just remind you briefly of a disclaimer that as much as I truly enjoy helping to inform you about topics related to your health and wellness, this is not medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. So if you have any specific questions related to your diagnosis, your individual treatment plan, then please discuss them with your doctor. And if I'm not your doctor and you'd like me to be, then definitely send me a message or click my book me link um, and I'd be happy to get you set up and ready for an appointment. Thanks so much again for joining. So now that all the fun disclaimers are out the way, say hey and let me know that you're tuning in. I'd love to see who's here. Um, if you're tuning in and catching the replay later, say hashtag replay. Would love to have you um, join me today. And let me know where you're tuning in from. I am in the Philadelphia area, a spot called Delaware County, right outside of Philadelphia. Let me know where you are joining us. Hi, Nina. Thanks so much for joining. Um, so yeah. Yeah, tonight's post, uh, tonight's Facebook Live, I think is going to be pretty interesting. It seems to cater to a lot of folks. I did a post on hypothyroidism recently and it gained a lot of traction. Um, it turns out that a lot of people are interested in this topic and no wonder um, because about 59 million people worldwide and an estimated 20 million people in the US have some form of thyroid disease and up to 60% of these people are actually unaware that they have any thyroid condition one in eight women will develop a thyroid disorder during their lifetime so it it I mean it's it spans a large amount of people even across this country let alone the world hi Janice uh, hi oh hi Joanna okay nice to see you here thanks so much for joining and I miss you guys in Georgia as well greatly greatly tell my Miller County family I said hello um, so yeah, there's a medication out there that's typically used for thyroid disorders. So we're going to talk a lot about thyroid, of course, today. Um, and mainly, you know, how do you diagnose it? Are the tests that your doctor currently running for thyroid disorders, are they super helpful or not? What tests should you be asking your doctor about to see if you have a thyroid disorder? And if you do, how can you work on getting better control of your thyroid? Um, so we'll talk about all that today. So if you you or someone you know is like tired all the time they feel like they got brain fog memory issues they're cold all the time or they're hot all the time or um, they've got issues with constipation I mean there the, it spans a wide ran, range of symptoms if you know anybody like that you better tag them to this video right now because they need to hear this information and I have a really awesome um, resource, free resource to share with you at the end. So definitely stick with me if you can. All right, so let's first talk about um, the conventional treatment, levothyroxin. Have you guys heard of that before? Let me know, give me a thumbs up, a comment, yes. Have you heard of this uh, medication called levothyroxin? It's also known as Synthroid. That is the synthetic form or the man-made form of thyroid hormone. And it's actually the fourth highest selling drug in the United States. Okay, so it, again, um, thyroid disorders really affect a lot of people. It's the fourth highest drug sold in the United States. And unfortunately, the number of people that are suffering from thyroid disorders, it continues to rise year by year by year. Um, so how do you know if you have a thyroid disorder? Let me know, what symptoms do you think are common for people with thyroid disorders? What, do you, what might you experience that might lead you to believe that you could be dealing with a thyroid issue and you might need to talk to your doctor? Um, let me share a couple with you. The most common symptoms include depression, dementia, so again, memory issues, 
weight gain. So if you are having a tough time losing weight and you've been exercising and eating well, or you're continuing to gain weight and you have no idea why, um, constipation, dry skin. Yes, Nina's correct. Change in weight up or down. So especially if your weight is going up, that's a symptom of your thyroid being low, being underactive. Um, if you have a hoarse voice, that's also a symptom of uh, hypothyroidism in some cases or even hyper. Um, if you're cold when others are not, this is what we call cold intolerance. So um, if you're the one who's always throwing a blanket on top of you or you need to tell your um, friends or your family to turn or your husband or whatever to turn down the air in the house um, and everybody else is like, what are you talking about? It's, it's fine. That could be a sign of um, hypothyroidism. If you have a regular menses, so if your periods, if you're a female, um, are not very predictable, that could also be a sign. Having to deal with infertility, muscle stiffness and pain, and there's a wide range of other unpleasant symptoms that could be signs of what's called hypothyroidism, which is a low functioning thyroid. So your thyroid gland, it sits right here in your neck. Um, and basically the way I like to explain it is it's basically the engine for your body. It keeps your metabolism going. It, there's thyroid receptors all over your body. And so no wonder it has, it plays a role in so many areas of your quality of life. Um, so if the engine is revving up, um, then you get you know all these overactive stuff going on. But if your engine is revving down in the condition like hypothyroidism, everything is just gonna move slower. So like we said, constipation, cause your bowels aren't moving, you feel foggy, you're tired, um, you're cold cause you're not generating enough heat, that engine's not you know moving quickly enough. Um, your menses are irregular, things like that. Your skin um, might be dry, your hair could be more brittle or thinning, all signs of hypothyroidism. And then on the other end, though it's not as common as hypothyroidism, is hyperthyroidism, which is just like it sounds, hyper, it's overactive. Um, and it's often actually a more serious condition because it's associated with an increased risk of heart attack, of stroke, and even of death. So when you have hyperthyroidism, you'll have those symptoms of, you know, your engine being overactive. So you'll get palpitations, your heart's racing too fast, rapid heartbeat, um, excessive sweating. So if you're sweaty and like, you know, everybody else is pretty darn dry, again, it could be a sign that your engine's too overactive, your thyroid's overactive. Um, if you're losing weight and that's inexplicable, you know, you've been uh, having a normal diet and all of a sudden you, you can't seem to fit your pants or anything, that could be a sign of hyperthyroidism. Um, if you have diarrhea because your bowels are overactive, anxiety, you might feel warm or get hot flashes all the time. Um, it may not be menopause, it could be a thyroid issue. Um, your appetite is higher than it used to be or if you have trouble sleeping. These could be signs of hyperthyroidism and overactive thyroid and overactive engine, again, which is here in your gland. Hi, um, Karen, thanks for joining us. Hi, Ver Venora, thanks so much for joining. Um, so again, we're talking about thyroid disorders. We just went over the common symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroidism. Thyroid gland sits right here in your neck. It's the engine for your body. It keeps things moving and grooving. And if it's underactive, everything slows down. Constipation, your mental um, fogness gets worse, your, your tiredness gets worse, everything on the sign of slow. And if you're hyper, then everything is moving too fast. You get palpitations, rapid heartbeat, you're hot all the time, diarrhea, things of that nature. So. The thing is, you know, clearly so many people are affected by affected by thyroid disorders. Again, 59 million people in the world, over 20 million people in the US. But the crazy statistic is that 60%, over 60% of us who have thyroid disorders go undiagnosed. We don't even know we have it. So how does that happen? Well, here's the deal. Unfortunately, it's because in conventional medicine, most of us doctors, we've been trained to check for thyroid disorder with just basically one test. If we are concerned that you have thyroid disorder, if you come to us as doctors and say that you've been tired or you've been constipated or 
um, you've been a little more depressed and we're concerned for um, a thyroid disorder, we usually check just one test in your blood. Does anybody have any idea what that test is? Let me know, take a guess. If you might be on a thyroid medication, your doctor might test this routinely to make sure that the thyroid is, um, that the medication's at the right dose. So the name of that test is called a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, if someone can put that in the comments for me, TSH. Most doctors check, yes, you got it, Dr. Nicole, thank you. Um, Karen says she has bad thyroids. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, definitely keep tuning in because I think I have some suggestions that might be able to um, help anyone who's, who's listening. So unfortunately, many people who have hypothyroidism and even symptoms of hypothyroidism or hyper, um, especially hypo though, a low functioning thyroid, do not have an abnormal TSH. So again, let me reiterate, a lot of people who have hypothyroidism, they may have a normal TSH, a normal TSH, and that's the only test that most doctors are using to diagnose it. So for that reason, there's a heck of a lot of people out there who are dealing, who are suffering from this disease, and they've been told your labs are normal or you're fine, when in fact you're not. So when your TSH is elevated, your doctor will typically then check a level of free T4, which is one of the forms of thyroid hormone that your thyroid gland produces. Um, T4 and T3 are your thyroid hormones. So if your TSH is high, this is a hormone that's created by a gland in your brain that is, like I said, thyroid stimulating hormone. It stimulates your thyroid to produce thyroid hormone, okay? So if your TSH is high and your free T4 is low, so your thyroid hormone itself is low, but your TSH is high because your brain is trying to make more to stimulate your thyroid to do its job, that's when most conventional doctors will diagnose you with hypothyroidism. But if you have symptoms of hypothyroidism and your TSH is normal, but your free T4 is low, then your doctor may still diagnose you with what's called subclinical hypothyroidism. Okay, so we, we still are able, some conventional doctors are still able to tease through that and say that you have hypothyroidism, but it's not quite, so we're gonna call it subclinical. If you're diagnosed with one of these two, hi Tina, thanks for joining. Um, hi Karen, thanks for joining. She says she's taking levothyroxine. So, okay, that's the common synthetic hormone that's made to treat a low functioning thyroid. If you're diagnosed with hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism, the most common treatment is, as Karen mentioned, tends to be levothyroxine and the brand name for that is Synthroid. The big issue with this, however, is that in many cases, we're just masking the symptoms and we're not necessarily getting to what is actually causing your hypothyroidism in the first place. So that's the problem. Although a prescription for thyroid hormone replacement like levothyroxine is sometimes a necessity, the first step should always be to determine why did your thyroid get out of whack in the first place? Right? Like, why did this organ, this engine in your body just go kaput or just go like crazy out of whack and start, you know, over functioning? How did that happen? Isn't that important? Shouldn't we maybe get to the, the root of that issue? Shouldn't we maybe figure out the piece to that puzzle before we um, mask the symptoms immediately by just pumping you with more thyroid hormone, man made thyroid hormone? So sometimes addressing the underlying cause of the thyroid problem is actually enough to resolve it without even getting to the point of prescribing thyroid supplementation. So the question is, what are the typical underlying causes that could lead to hypothyroidism or even hyperthyroidism? The two major causes of thyroid disorders what do you guys think? Any guesses? Let me know. Tina says she's on 1.75 of Synthroid. Okay, um, so probably you mean 175, 175 micrograms. So thyroid um, Synthroid or levothyroxine, it goes from as low as 12.5 micrograms to as high as like 300. If someone's on 300 or more, there's something really off. There's 
there's something really off. So we'll leave it at that. we'll leave it at that. The most common um, the most common calculation that I've found is appropriate for those that we do have on uh, Synthroid or Levothyroxine. Just FYI, we say that the typical appropriate dose for most people is 1.7 micrograms per kilogram. I'm sorry, we don't do anything in pounds. We all go by the international standard of, of um, scientific numbers. So figure out what you are in kilograms. And typically it's 1.7 micrograms per kilogram is usually about where people end up um, as the appropriate dose of Synthroid, just so you know. Tina said, no one ever explained that or asked questions about why. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, that's why we are having this talk today in hopes that I can um, shed some light on a couple of uh, miscommunicated points. Um, for Vanora says growth mass. Okay, so yeah, that is potentially a cause. Um, well, that's actually more so a consequence, believe it or not, of your thyroid being either too active or too or underactive is when that can lead to um, a what's called a goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid. Or yes, you could have an, what's called a nodule um, on your thyroid and if it is causing or stimulating your thyroid to be overactive, um, that also could be the case, correct? So um, when your doctor, so let me answer that question. The two major causes of thyroid disorders are nutrient deficiency and autoimmune disease. So did you guys know, anyone who's dealing with a thyroid disorder, did you know that like 80, percent almost as close as 90 percent especially of hypothyroid conditions tend to be related to an autoimmune thing um, so we're going to dive into that a little bit more when your doctor checks a tsh and a free t4 level which for most of us that's all we've been taught to check as doctors that's only half the story it's also important for them to check these levels a t3 um, because T3 is actually the active form of thyroid hormone. T4 is only about 15 to 20% active compared to T3 hormone. So isn't that crazy? We're checking this T4 and doesn't really mean all that much because it's not the T4 that's helping to, to do what thyroid hormones needs to do in your body. You actually need to convert T4 to T3 with the help of some certain nutrients. And yes, you're correct. Um, Tanisha, iodine deficiency is a potential cause of hypothyroidism, especially, but also hyperthyroidism. Um, you need iodine to convert, to help convert the T4, the inactive form of thyroid hormone, to T3, which is the active form. So when your doctor is checking or is concerned for a thyroid disorder, they need to check a TSH, a free T4, a regular T4, a T3, and a free T3 level. And some doctors might even check a reverse T3 level, but that gets kind of complicated. So at least those five things. So like I said, the two most common causes of thyroid disorders are a nutrient issue or autoimmune disease. So let's first start with the nutrient deficiency. What kind of nutrients, We um, Tanisha had mentioned iodine, thank you, that is so correct. Um, what other nutrient deficiencies do you think play a role in um, causing hyper or hypothyroid? If you've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, it may be a very good idea to ask your doctor if you can have um, some of these levels checked, which we're going to talk about, because these particular deficiencies can often cause a low functioning thyroid. Tanisha mentioned iodine. Perfect. A deficiency in iodine can cause hypothyroidism and goiter and enlarged thyroid. If you've ever seen someone with a, you know, a kind of lump here, a mass here, that is likely due to their thyroid either way over functioning or under functioning. And they could be even deficient in iodine. So that's something if you've ever noticed that in any of your close friends, loved ones, etc., or even yourself, then you definitely need to get that checked out. Um, there was actually a random person that I met like in a supermarket one day and I just like had to tell her because um, it was it was a teenage girl and, and her and they were very grateful because that was not being addressed. 
Um, zinc is another nutrient deficiency, which is also required to make thyroid hormones. So if you're deficient in zinc, then you should also, um, you know, if you're deficient in zinc, it could lead to a thyroid disorder. So that should be checked. And selenium is another important cofactor, which is required to convert T4 to T3, which is the, again, the active form. So if someone can put those in the comments for me, the deficiencies that definitely could play a big role in causing a thyroid disorder are iodine, zinc, and selenium. Now, as for autoimmune disease, the most common cause of thyroid disorders, have you ever heard of this before, is something called Hashimoto's disease. It sounds like I'm sure it, I'm sure it originated from Japan. I'm not the best anthropo anthropo anthropologist um, when it comes to like the science background of what's named after who, but Hashimoto's disease is actually the most common cause of hypothyroidism, low functioning thyroid. And what that means, it's an autoimmune disease. What that means is basically your own body is making antibodies that attacks your thyroid gland and it eventually destroys its ability to produce thyroid hormone and that's what leads to hypothyroidism okay uh, so your own body is basically creating a defense mechanism against your own thyroid gland that's why we call it auto like self immune you are immune you're building an immune response against yourself so it's an autoimmune disease um, Graves' disease is on the other spectrum. It's another autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid gland, but it causes the, th it causes the thyroid to do the opposite. It actually becomes enlarged and overactive. Um, and those are the two major forms of autoimmune disease that can cause a thyroid disorder. And a way to, you can actually find out if you have Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. You can find that out with just a simple blood test. And I always recommend that if anyone is diagnosed with a thyroid condition, you should have these antibodies checked. And again, unfortunately, as conventional doctors, we were not, were not originally trained to check for these antibodies. And that's honestly because the conventional treatment, which is Synthroid or Levothyroxine, it doesn't really treat um, Hashimoto's or Graves effectively. Again, it just kind of masks the symptoms. So it doesn't make a difference in conventional medicine if you have Hashimoto's or some other cause of your thyroid disorder because we're gonna treat it all the same anyway. But if you're taking a different approach and you're trying to like really get a little bit more deep into it, get into the root cause, that is when it's important to find out, do you have Hashimoto's, do you have Graves, what's going on? And we check that with antibody tests. Um, these are called thyroglobulin antibody and a anti-TPO antibody, anti-thyroid peroxidase antibody. So those two antibodies um, are major when it comes to um, detecting Hashimoto's disease. Okay, so when it comes to detecting Graves, we check other antibodies as well. So it's really important if you're diagnosed with hyper or hypothyroidism, get your antibody levels checked, okay? And even though not all people with Hashimoto's have hypothyroid symptoms, so there are some people who might test positive for Hashimoto's, but you feel totally fine. That is great news. Unfortunately though, it does also mean that you are much more likely to develop thyroid disease in the future if you trigger your immune system um, for that to happen. So it's, it, it's been found also that people who have Hashimoto's, unfortunately, they tend to have something that we call polyendocrine autoimmune pattern, which basically means that more than one gland in your body is dealing with this autoimmune thing, this self-attack. So that means that not only might you be dealing with Hashimoto's or underactive thyroid, you could also be dealing with um, type 1 diabetes or celiac disease or anemia um, or even anxiety or panic attacks related to an autoimmune thing. So it's definitely, definitely important to get that checked. And the big thing is that if there is an autoimmune cause to your thyroid issue, 
it's super important to begin to balance and regulate your immune system so you can slow down or even stop the attack on your thyroid gland. And unfortunately, in many cases, because so many people are diagnosed so late in the game, um, your thyroid has already dealt with so much destruction. It, at whatever destruction your thyroid's dealt with, it's already, unfortunately, at least we haven't figured out any other way from studies, it's irreversible. The destruction that your thyroid gland has dealt with, I am sorry to say, is in most cases irreversible. But once you catch it in its tracks, um, if you have Hashimoto's or some other form of thyroid disease or graves related to um, a nutrient deficiency, whatever the case may be, once you get to the underlying issue, you can slow down the progression of that attack. You can, in fact, stop the attack. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about diet. There are four primary dietary concerns for people with thyroid problems. Any guesses of the kind of foods that can trigger or worsen um, a thyroid disorder? I'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts? What kind of foods might make a thyroid disorder worse or what kind of foods may in fact um, trigger a thyroid disorder to begin um, in your situation? Tina asked, does thyroid problems play a role in having psoriasis? Um, that is a very good question. Not necessarily, but they are linked. Meaning that, as I mentioned, um, if you have Hashimoto's or Graves, for example, you are prone to be someone who has what's called polyendocrine autoimmune response. Um, so that means that um, psoriasis, from what we understand, also has some autoimmune background to it. Um, so you are much more likely to have psoriasis if you have Hashimoto's or Graves. In addition to that though, um, thyroid disorders, especially hypothyroidism, does lead to dry skin. And uh, it could come and manifest in a way that you might think it is psoriasis. It looks very, very similar. Um, so those are the links there. Uh, Shauna says broccoli. Yes, yeah, so that's one of them. There are certain foods Primary, uh, primary certain foods that will exacerbate or worsen a thyroid disorder. And Shauna's on point with broccoli. There are certain foods called goitrogens. Yeah, that's a tongue tie. Goitrogens that can increase the need for iodine or damage the thyroid gland. And broccoli is one of those foods, goitrogens, okay? Um, another is your intake of iodine and selenium. If you're low in that, um, then that could trigger or worsen a thyroid issue. If you are eating foods that potentially trigger an autoimmune response, or if you're eating a very low carb diet, that can um, decrease your thyroid function. So I'm gonna go over a little bit um, those four things, why? So let's first talk about goitrogens. <laughs> These compounds, they were fine in research done like way back in the 1920s. Goitrogenic foods, or chemicals have been associated with thyroid disorder, both hyper and hypo, thyroid cancers, and autoimmune thyroid issues like Hashimoto's or Graves. Shauna said cauliflower. Yes, that is another goitrogenic food. So um, she mentioned broccoli and cauliflower. Other foods that have been identified um, to be goitrogenic are yucca, also known as cassava, soy, millet, sweet potatoes, um, cruciferous vegetables like cauliflower and broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, bok choy, kale, collard greens. Um, the main goitrogenic chemicals, um, they can include percolates, which are used in jet fuel, oxazolidines, those are in, plant, in paints a lot of time and in a lot of different paints, amiodarone, which is a medication often used for um, regulating the heart rhythm. That's a goitrogenic chemical. Lithium, which is used for a number of reasons, particularly mental disorders and seizure disorders, and benzodiazepines, medicines like Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, things like that, used for depression, anxiety, etc. Those are all um, goit foods that contain goitrogens and chemicals that contain goitrogens. These can exacerbate or trigger a hypo or hyper hyperthyroid condition. So here's the thing. Don't go crazy. Don't go running to your pantry and your fridges and ripping out all the broccoli and the bok choy. That's not what I'm saying. Let me um, preface this a little bit. At low amounts, goitrogens, they stop your thyroid gland from taking in iodine. 
So that can usually be improved with taking an iodine supplement. But if you're taking a large amount of goitrogens, this is when it could potentially stop your thyroid from using the iodine altogether. And if that happens, not even the iodine supplements could help. So if you cook though, if you cook or especially boil or steam these goitrogenic foods, it can reduce the goitrogen chemical amount in those foods to just one third of the value, which is helpful. So those foods in particular, I would advise if you're concerned for a thyroid disorder, not to eat them raw. Definitely boil or steam them. A lot of these foods are definitely very nutritious, so I'm not telling you that you should eliminate them from your diet entirely, but I would say that um, you should make sure to to be cognizant of the amount of intake. So around five to seven servings a week, eating them cooked and not raw. Um, for a pregnant woman, I would actually decrease that even more for a reason that I'm not gonna like bore you with right now. Shauna says, I'm hypothyroid and struggle with weight loss. Any suggestions? So I've got a couple of them here for you at the live and stick around. I have more to share, a, a great resource to share. And if you're in the Philadelphia area, um, you need to hit me up. Um, and if not, we can definitely work on telemedicine to talk about this a bit more about your particular situation. Uh, Venora says she eats so much broccoli. Well, broccoli is really good for you. It's very nutritious. But if you're concerned for a thyroid disorder in particular, again, like I said, be careful. Definitely don't eat them raw. Cook them, steam them, boil them, um, and be careful about the amount of servings. Only one a day, pretty much, at, mo at most. So all right, now let's talk a little bit more about iodine. It's not super common for those living in North America, thank goodness, to be deficient in iodine. And that's because uh, manufacturers kind of like throw it in so much of our food, commercial salt and dairy products and certain breads and even in seafood and sea vegetables like seaweed. Um, so iodine's in a lot of our food. However, if you're pregnant, or if you don't eat much of the foods that I just mentioned, it is possible that you could be deficient in, um, in iodine. So in our family, we actually eat a lot of uh, seaweed chi chips to keep our iodine intake up because we don't eat um, a lot of the commercial, we don't really have much dairy in our house and we don't use commercial table salts and things like that but we eat plenty of seaweed, um, our babies included. So some other foods that are higher in iodine are cod, shrimp, um, eggs, tuna, uh, but seaweed, it beats out all those foods in iodine content by like 10 times, okay? So I would suggest if you are deficient in iodine and you can get this level checked, your iodine level checked, um, you can get it checked in your blood, but I'll be frank, the more accurate test is a 24 hour iodine in your urine, um, which maybe some conventional doctors aren't entirely certain how to check that, but certainly most um, integrative or functional medicine doctors can. So I would definitely give seaweed a try though. You can use kelp flakes instead of salt because they're very salty. You could eat seaweed as a snack or a side dish. We just snack on them instead of chips. Um, there are tons of ways to incorporate seaweed into your diet. It's possible though to take in too much iodine. So if you experience any symptoms of hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism while eating more iodine containing foods, it could actually be a sign that you are deficient in selenium. Um, so that is when you should, if you're eating a lot of seaweed and you start to feel more tired or your heart start racing or you're constipated or you're, you know, things like that, then you should scale back on the seaweed. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking an iodine supplement until you have your levels checked uh, because you can become toxic in iodine. So discuss that with your doctor for sure. Venora says Brazil nuts, good question. Um, in fact, Brazil nuts are actually a biggie in selenium content. Um, and we'll talk about selenium now. It's selenium deficiency in North America um, it's actually pretty rare in uh, people in North America and people of African descent um, because it has to do with the content of the selenium in the soil where you are and your local foods. But if you're found to have a selenium deficiency, which again can be checked with blood work, it's called an RBC selenium test, you can increase it with things like, for Nora said, Brazil nuts, 
Um, there's also seafood like tuna, halibut, sardines. Those are all pretty high in selenium content, okay? And so what about the foods that trigger immune response? Any idea about what those foods could be? What kind of foods um, should we probably avoid that could be causing this Hashimoto's condition or this Graves condition, the autoimmune causes of thyroid disorder? So we talked about the nutrient issues, right? So there are two major reasons why you could have a thyroid problem, an underlying issue why you could have a thyroid problem. One is nutrient deficiency. So we talked about being deficient in iodine, selenium. So those are big, big things, okay? And also, um, if you were eating too many goitrogens, those are another big, major cause of nutrient issues. But what about the autoimmune thing? There are foods that can trigger an autoimmune response. And these are foods that we call nightshades. Have you ever heard of nightshades before? Um, so I, I didn't know too much about it until I started doing, you know, a lot of research when I wanted to really dig deeper for the sake of myself and for my patients um, a number of years ago and understand nutrition and uh, lifestyle changes that could make a difference. Um, but nightshades basically, those are, um, there's nightshade vegetables, uh, I'll name them. There are also eggs and dairy products that might worsen or even trigger an autoimmune response in some people. But nightshade foods, they're a category that include potatoes, tomatoes, tomatillos, um, sweet and hot peppers, eggplant, cayenne pepper, not black pepper though, um, pimentos, pepinos, and paprika. So those are the most common, if not all, I might have named them all, um, nightshade foods. And those can um, definitely, definitely trigger this Hashimoto's or Graves condition. So I have a very helpful autoimmune diet handout that I use with my patients to help them work out the foods that they can eat and um, to stay away from certain foods. So if you're found to have Hashimoto's or Graves disease, those are the foods, those nightshades foods, um, eggs and dairy for some people as well that you should avoid for at least a period of time and then slowly introduce them one step at a time with the help of your provider to see which foods could be triggering your condition. So um, for example, I usually will start my patients with any autoimmune condition on what's called the elimination diet. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's not bare bones. You still eat enough calories every day, et cetera, et cetera but you are staying away from what could be the triggers for you. And after you're on the elimination diet for a month or two and you notice an amazing difference in your body, then you can slowly reintroduce those foods one at a time every few days so you can monitor um, what was it. Was it eggs that you know made me feel super tired or was it to tomatoes that made me feel super tired, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the deal with gluten? Have you guys heard about gluten? Have you heard about gluten being an issue with regards to thyroid disorders or autoimmune disorders? I've seen that most of my patients with any autoimmune disease, they tend to do better when they avoid grains entirely, but especially wheat, which contains gluten, and it's been shown to trigger inflammation in the body, especially if you're dealing with an autoimmune disorder. The best way to explain it is that um, the gluten molecule looks very similar to your immune system as your thyroid. And so if you introduce your body to gluten, um, your body assumes that more thyroid hormones being produced and uh, it just goes nuts and starts to attack your thyroid even more. That's the best way to, do, to, to explain it. It's, it's a process that we call molecular mimicry, okay? Um, Tina says, no. Nina says, I just know that most products advertise gluten-free. Well, yeah, that's true. And that's fine. Um, if you were concerned for a thyroid disorder, especially if you're found to have Hashimoto's or Graves, then yeah, your best bet really is to be gluten-free. It doesn't mean that you have to buy all the boxed and bagged foods that say gluten-free. It also means that maybe you wanna just um, eat from home more often, cook from scratch. You know if it has gluten, if you're cooking it. So gluten is in um, mostly wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Um, so if you stay away from that and you're cooking from home, from scratch, then you really should be okay in most cases. Now I also mentioned low carb diets. 
Interestingly enough, we actually need insulin for proper thyroid hormone metabolism. So basically for the conversion of T4, the inactive form of thyroid hormone to T3, T3 again, it's five times more metabolically active than T4. So in order for our body, so insulin is needed for us to change from that inactive T4 to active T3 thyroid hormone. The thing is though, for our body to produce insulin, a response needs to be triggered by us by eating a decent amount of carbs and protein. So for those with thyroid problems, especially those with low T3 levels, it's usually best to have a diet at least 20% of your calories from carbs and at least 10% of your calories from protein. Of course, this is definitely different for everyone. I'm a big, big advocate for personalizing your treatment plan. No man should have the same exact uh, diet. I don't think that there's a perfect diet for everyone in this world. It depends on your particular situation. So your situation could be more complicated if you have diabetes um, or a protein metabolism disorder. Uh, that's why you, you probably can't stick to, you know, um, stay, you, you probably will not be able to deal with the low carb diet if you have that on top of thyroid. So that's why personalizing your lifestyle plans with your doctor and your healthcare provider, they're extremely important. Tina says she's a type one, so she has a couple of issues. Exactly. So it's really important for you to coordinate a personalized treatment plan with your doctor so that they can, you know, handle the nuances behind the scenes, monitor certain things with labs to make sure that you've got the right ratio, et cetera, et cetera, for you. Now, I wish I could share all of my pearls with you today, but that could keep us here for hours and hours and hours, but it's important to keep <clears throat> other lifestyle things in mind. So managing your stress plays a huge role in thyroid functioning. And in addition, just a reminder that 80% of your immune system, it lies in your gut. So if you have an autoimmune issue and your gut is having issues, then you are more likely to trigger a Hashimoto's or Graves condition. So if you've got something like low stomach acid or leaky gut or what's called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, or you have a chronic infection in your gut, all of these things could trigger or worsen a thyroid, autoimmune thyroid disease. So you should definitely work with someone who can help test you for these issues and treat them appropriately. And as for supplements, I know a lot of people wonder about supplements, if that could be helpful. I have a particular protocol that I use with my patients based on their levels of iodine, selenium, vitamin D, zinc, etc. So it's important, again, it should be somewhat personalized that you work along with a healthcare provider who can help you supplement appropriately because over supplementation could be very dangerous as well. Tina says stress, haha. -ha. <laughs> so yeah, stress is real. Um, stress affects people in a lot of ways. So um, work with someone, whether that be your partner or your therapist or your doctor to help figure out ways to better manage your stress. I've also seen great improvements for people who have used um, zinc, ashwagandha, curcumin. Um, there's a tincture called bugleweed that's actually really helpful for people um, with hyperthyroidism as well. So again, these need to be with the coordinated help of your doctor because there are potential for interactions and adverse effects. As for other forms of thyroid supplementation, I'm surprised no one's asked me yet. And let, let me know, I'm about to end shortly. So if you have any other questions, um, plug them in now, I'll try to stick on. And I wanna share with you a quick free resource um, very soon, so stick with me. Um, there is what's called thyroid glandulars, also known as desiccated thyroid. Have you heard of that before? This is the non-prescription form of thyroid hormone replacement. It's basically thyroid gland. It's usually a pig's or a cow's that's been freeze dried and powdered and then placed into a capsule or a tablet. And we found, um, I would say anecdotally, I'm not really certain about the paper studies out there, I'll be frank, that these do tend to have less side effects for many patients than the prescription form. Um, but you really, really, really need to use it with caution because if you take too much, you could easily end up in a hyperthyroid state, which definitely could be deadly. So the same as if you were taking Synthroid or Levothyroxine, the prescription brand, you should still have your thyroid hormone levels checked routinely, um, even if you're taking the natural form, the um, thyroid glands or desiccated thyroid, okay? 
Um, so what questions do you have? Anyone? Thyroid glandular? No, she has, Tina hasn't heard of that before. So that's okay. It happens. A lot of people have not, but it is something worth um, mentioning to your doctor, especially if um, you were having any side effects with the Synthroid or Levothyroxine. Um, some people, it's not really often just the, the medication itself, but the fillers that they put in there, the dye that they use for the capsule or the tablet. So those are all things definitely worth keeping in mind. Um, Joanna says, any tips on taking Levothyroxine and other supplements? I know a lot of things can hinder the absorption. Thanks for bringing that up, Joanna. That's a good question. It's definitely important if you do take levothyroxine or even the desiccated thyroid to take it on an empty stomach. Um, that is very, very important. Um, ideally, 30 minutes before your first meal of the day. You do hinder the absorption greatly if you are um, taking it and you've eaten already. So I'd like to share with you guys um, a resource that I um, have created and have available for you. Um, it's called the seven foods to help boost your thyroid. So just share the link with you at the bottom and I'll put it in the comments as well. It's a free resource that um, I have available. I think that it's super helpful for um, anyone in hypo or hyperthyroid situation. And I'd love to have you take on this resource, share it with other people, share the link with other people um, so they can also uh, learn more and get free information because knowledge is power for real. So um, that is my mission, is to share as much of my knowledge as I possibly can so that you and our communities can become well, whole, energized, and loving life. So check out the link, um, click on it, get the free resource uh, for seven foods to help uh, boost your thyroid, seven natural foods to boost your thyroid. And if you have other questions, feel free to message me. Um, I'd be happy to help. Again, unfortunately, if I'm not your doctor, I can't give you personalized advice, but I will try my best to lead you in the right direction. And if you'd like me to be, hey, guess what? I have a practice. Um, so consider joining us at Synergize Direct Primary Care. We're really excited about um, those who have joined so far and for the mission that we're on to really get our uh, community well. And, and we're able to see anyone not just in Delaware County, but in Philadelphia counties and surrounding suburbs because we do telemedicine too, guys. So you don't have to drive like three, uh, an hour even, or three hours, whatever, to come and see me. Um, I can see you through video chat, just like we're doing right now. So consider it. Uh, I think that I'm a pretty good doctor. You can ask other people, um, but we'd be excited to have you. So join us if you can, uh, but click on the, re the resource link. I'd be happy to, I'm happy to share that with you. And uh, until the next time, guys, I do hope that you continue to be well. Let me just check for any other questions. Nina says, I'm sorry if I missed this. What if someone has experienced a surgery involving thyroid removal? Um, that's a good question. The big thing with that, unfortunately, is that clearly is not reversible. I don't know of any situations where someone's been able to grow, regrow their thyroid. I've heard about that, but I don't know if it's real, and I wouldn't trust that information quite yet. So in that situation, unfortunately, your best bet would be to um, take a thyroid hormone supplement but consider a natural desiccated thyroid um, hormone as opposed to the man-made or synthetic. It's likely to deal with, uh, cause you long-term or even short-term side effects. Um, and it still would not help, it still would not hurt for you to also consider um, what we talked about with regards to deficiencies as well, because even if you're taking a, um, a natural, but you're, a natural exterior hormone, thyroid hormone, and you're taking that into your body, you still want to try to make it as active as possible. So making sure that you're not deficient in iodine or selenium or zinc or vitamin D, those things will all still play a major role. Um, let me see for any other questions. Tina says, I have this call from time to time as I have swallowed pepper. I think it has something to do with my thyroid. That is um, not an impossible possibility, Tina. It's tough to say because I'm not your doctor and I can't, I'm not examining you, um, but I would definitely talk with your doctor uh, about that concern for sure uh, because yes, that is not, that cough can be caused by, by hypothyroidism, especially if, or hyperthyroidism, especially if there's a nodule on your thyroid that could be leading to the issue. Oh, thank you for all the nice words, guys. Um, 
And I'm so glad that you all have uh, found this information helpful. Definitely share it with your friends and loved ones. Share it on your Facebook page. I want as many people as possible to get this information and do better for themselves because we need to be well. We have, you know, lives that are depending on us, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not the only one. For those of you who um, have moms and dads that you need to take care of, kids you need to take care of, siblings you need to take care of, cousins, husbands, wives. Um, I'm sure that you want to be there for them. And it's tough to be there when you're run down or foggy or constipated or your heart's pumping hard all the time. Or you're, you know, when you're not comfortable and you're not yourself. So let's get you well, whole, energized, and loving life. And until next time, I do wish you guys a great rest of your day. Take care.